we're here to discuss the ups, downs and sideways of the sport of figure skating and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. This week's hosts are Evie, Zelda, Leigh and Gina. Yay! We are on the fifth episode. So yeah, just a short uh, introduction. Um, I'm Tilda and I'm from Sweden. Um, I'm a political scientist, but I think it's much more fun to talk about figure skating on here. My Twitter handle is at Tilda. I'm Gina. I'm from England, but I live in Korea. My Twitter handle handle is Gina Waso. Hi, I'm Lei. I'm the Australian you mixed up with Evie in the first episode. Um, I'm currently yoling my life savings and post graduation time to travel around Europe and the US and blogging about it. You can find me on Twitter at Axel Sandwich. Hi, I'm Evie, and I'm the Australian you mixed up with Lei in the first episode. When I'm not screaming at figure skating online, you can find me editing this podcast. My Twitter handle is at Double Flats. Okay, so we're going to cover briefly some figure skating news because um, I said in the first episode that Evgenia's move to Toronto was the biggest news of off-season, um, and clearly the universe uh, accepted that as a challenge because <laughs> Daisuke Takahashi <laughs> just announced that he would return to competition. So, Wow. This is... <laughs> It's pretty insane considering, you know, he's 32, he's been out of competition for, what, four years now, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of nowhere, announces, I'm going to be coming back to competition this season. To be honest, it's the news of the decade. It is pretty much. Um, And to be fair, he's not, he hasn't explicitly stated anything about returning to international competition. Um, I'm pretty sure his goal right now is to make the Japanese nationals, but even that will be pretty like insane like we were joking about yuzu potentially having to go to regionals and now like literally the poor kids at the kinky regionals in japan are going to be competing against daisuke takahashi like let's just stop and soak that in for a bit (laughs) it's pretty insane and like i i also i commend the fact that he said in his interviews and stuff that he would feel bad about taking those international spots away from other Japanese skaters if he did make it to Nats. So that's kind of admirable to see him say that in in those interviews after he announced his return to competition. I think it's a really great message it sends. Like, you don't have to retire and you, like, at a certain age and you can come back. And it doesn't matter if you are thinking about winning. You could just enjoy competing. Yeah, I love that. I love that perspective. Something else that happened is uh, Yuzu Hanyu got the People's Honor Award and um, he also brought his two Olympic gold medals to support a school in Fukushima that had only recently opened after the 2011 disaster. We finally got the Yuzu, like, we finally got Yuzu and his two Olympic gold medals. But I think it's just lovely that it's like a testament to how much he is focused on the recovery of Sendai and like the entire like Tohoku province to have brought out the two Olympic gold medals in this sort of significant occasion literally for the children but well, the and the people's honor award that he did receive is uh the highest civilian honor that Japan bestows to its uh to its people so you know that's a really big deal and he's also the youngest recipient of the award ever so just, and the only figure yeah. skater to get it and as the well. only figure skater yeah so it's a big deal for him Something that is not quite as fun is that Britain is uh, going to reduce spending for winter sports. Yeah, so uh, UK Sport has announced that they will be completely removing all funding for speed skating, figure skating and bobsled. And so on the way into the 2022 Olympics, um, those sports are getting no funding whatsoever. Great Britain doesn't have a lot of internationally active skaters. but I, I am concerned for Coombs and Buckland um, for Ice Dance. They're the strongest British team and they just come back from injury. It would be really sad if it's difficult for them now because they can't get any funding. And he's, I think, broken another record here with that free skate. Oh, without a doubt. Well, um, we are going to focus the main segment of this episode on issues of gender bias in figure skating. And it's, you know, a huge topic so we're not going to be able to cover everything, but Evie's here, first of all, to give you a historical perspective on figure skating in the early years and gender. Finally, finally, my degree is coming in handy. I'm very excited time about to this. Shine. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning of figure skating, you know, it the early years of figure skating, especially around the development of the ISU itself, gender 
and figure skating had a much different relationship to it than it does nowadays. Figure skating wasn't so much barred by gender, it was much more barred by class because, you know, very few people had the resources to not only compete internationally but even travel internationally. So, and there were no firm rules in competition that barred women from competing. In fact, in 1902 at the World Championships, Madge Sires, who uh, represented England, got the silver medal behind, uh, I believe, a Swedish figure, male figure skater. So she was, and she was the only woman to compete that year. So it was mixed competitions initially. Yes, it was, it was completely mixed in the early years. In fact, Madge Sires winning the silver medal kind of got the ball rolling to bar, basically barring women for competition. They originally wanted to uh, completely bar women from all the ISU championships. And they actually, it actually passed in the ISU in 1903 to do that, um, much to the neglect mainly of um, Britain because, you know, they have a sort of world silver medalist now. They don't want to lose her because she's not allowed to compete anymore. And so in 1906, they relented and established the, uh, the ISU Women's Championship, which was separate completely from the actual world championships. And women did not become world champions. They just became the generic ISU champions. Of course. Because we can't have nice things. Basically, the the Congress this year wasn't so bad. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been much worse. And then in 1924, uh, the women's championships were merged with the men's. And in fact, figure skating at the first Winter Olympics, once the Winter Olympics became separate from the Summer Olympics, figure skating was the only sport available to women. So there was this shift. Yeah, definitely. There was a definite shift in the late 1800s to early 1900s to 1920 of women who were slowly gaining more confidence to go and compete in figure skating and then also being allowed to compete in figure skating and then not being allowed to compete in figure skating. You know, there's a, there were a lot of changes. The main... The main turn, I feel, for the way that gender is perceived in figure skating was Sonia Henney, who competed for Norway and her, her success in the field of women's figure skating. So she was a 10-time consecutive world champion and she was the Olympic champion in 1928, 1932 and 1936. Uh, Sonia, she's credited for beginning a lot of major trends in women's figure skating. So she popularised uh, wearing white boots, short skirts and dresses while while skating and wearing you know very cute kind of traditionally like the girly fashion kind of thing you have to think that in the early days of figure skating the differences between the styles were very less complex than they are today in the early days of figure skating it was very you barely ever saw arms being lifted above the waist and there was really not that much difference between women's figure skating and men's figure skating in terms of style. They were very similar. But Sonia Henney's style of figure skating very much changed that. She cited that uh, a lot of her programs were based off ballet and dance. And this also, like, especially when she was competing in the 20s and 30s, when dancing was so popular, especially among the upper classes, the interaction between her skating and dancing kind of popularised it amongst a lot of the higher classes. And so she, not only she rose to fame, but women's figure skating rose to fame in a way that men's didn't. And so she was definitely seen as the face of figure skating, especially after she uh, quit competing and got a movie deal in the States. So there was... Uh, when she was in her prime, the U.S. Figure Skating Association reported like a 63% increase in those taking figure skating proficiency tests between the years of ni- of the seasons of 1939 and 40, and 1941 and 40 and 41. So that's a massive increase in people ta- taking those tests, and the majority of those te- people taking the tests were young girls, specifically middle to high class white American girls. So they were the main, you know. They, they were the main target audience now for figure skating in the around the 1930s and 40s. And Sonia Henney was a figurehead to look up to. She changed the entire landscape of how figure skating was perceived. And of course, around that time as well, no, men's figure skating was being brushed aside because World War II was, gonna, was happening slash just about to happen and conscription was the thing. Mm. And of course, with the majority of young men going off to fight in World War II, you know, as all these girls came into the sport, all the boys left for military service. 
So, you know, the Toronto Skating Club organized practices around the military duties of the men and others offered free membership to those uh, serving nearby. But, you know, figure skating really didn't have any kind of use in a military point of view because it wasn't rough and it wasn't tactical in the way that other sports that were practiced uh, in the military at that time were. So, and masculinity in that time was very, was being shaped by the image of the soldier. And the image of the figure skater in that time was aligned in direct opposition to that. So by the time conscription had ended, you know, the sport was so popularized by Sonia Henney. Uh, there were so many more girls in it that it just, to let the boys back into the sport was could have almost been seen as troublesome or just in general not great. So basically there's a historical reason for why figure skating is perceived the way it is today as well. Definitely, yeah. It goes far, yeah. far back. It's very interesting. So I think that actually leads us into a perfect segue into talking about issues that uh, ladies face. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to this lingering legacy and image that Sonia Henney like started and popularized, but was also obviously like continued by media and Hollywood movies and just everything over the ages. Um, and so Tilda, take it away. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there is an inherent contradiction in women doing sports. Because um, to be competitive and to want to win is considered to be not feminine. So if a competitive nature is unladylike, then, you know, all female athletes in all sports face like an inherent paradox. Um, Because they can't be soft and gentle and still be competitive and want to win. So in other sports, say football, the female athletes can be aggressive and seen as masculine or at least not feminine. And that sort of comes with its own issues for them. But it's also sort of part of the deal in being a female athlete in a lot of cases. And most female athletes aren't scored based on how well they perform femininity. But for figure skaters, it's trickier because um, the sport incorporates an element of performing art. And the predominant image of the sport um, is what we talked about. And that's still sort of these qualities of being, uh, you know, delicate, ladylike, a pretty figure, which... On one hand, the the female uh, skaters have to be athletic. They have to do these incredible, difficult things. But on the other hand, they also have to present this sort of image. So the question then becomes, you know, how can you be gentle and delicate and still be an elite athlete? I mean, there used to be a stronger division for what constitutes ladies skating and men skating. Now those restrictions have been lightened and we find it very interesting especially this season when the free men's free skate has been shortened by 30 seconds and has a reduction of one jump element so it actually now matches the requirements of the ladies free skate yet i think we can say even though there's no longer strict requirements on elements like spirals and bielmans and laybacks certain moves that are associated with lady skating that it's unusual for men to attempt them. Yeah, because lady skaters tend to be sort of pigeonholed into two categories. Athletic powerful, which is often carried for masculine, or, you know, delicate, graceful, feminine. And ladies can be praised for either, but it sort of ignores the fact that there's a lot more nuance. Graceful, delicate skaters can also be very powerful. And uh, athletic skaters can also have um, a lot more to them than just having, you know, big jumps. And... Uh, Rarely, but rarely do them do the female skaters sort of transcend these pigeonholes. In fact, as figure skating is a very technical sport, so these ladies are doing most of the same types of content. So the dichotomy between graceful skaters and athletic skaters seems inherently wrong. And I personally think it's quite clear that graceful and feminine is the ideal, and that this can lead to ladies who don't get perceived as such to be seen as lesser. Like they're already at a disadvantage and have to compensate in other ways. Yeah, I think I like there's nothing wrong with being like either of the two, but I suppose the concern is whether these sort of pigeonholes become sort of ways of maintaining the boundaries in what is, I think, still quite a traditional and conservative sport at heart. So it's kind of, you know, if you're only categorizing or only making available these two um, boxes for lady skaters to be characterized at, like that really just maintains this idea that femininity can only be one or the other. Even if you've expanded these boxes by adding another one saying, you know, women can be athletic and powerful, I think 
even just the existence of the two boxes still kind of makes femininity and its definition quite rigid. And I think art is about innovation. And if we look at kind of remixes um, in other performing arts, we have, for example, Swan Lake sort of interpretations that completely challenge these conventions. Um, and, you know, the question is, if we had Swan Lake in pants and a new interpretation in, you know, ballet or in acting or drama, that wouldn't be seen as something different um, or something negative. But I think that in figure skating, there's this undeniable feeling that there's a certain way to play safe um, because it's a competitive environment and people are judged like on that program and it does affect their marks. And so that's generally where war horses come in, for example, their classical European pieces from ballet and opera. And we're sure that the judges would like it because they've been performed over and over, you know, 20 30 years ago. And I think if we think of popular war horses like Swan Lake, Carmen, Sherazade, Miss Saigon, like these are all very limited archetypal female roles that female skaters across the ages have sort of performed over and over again. And you can almost exactly picture the type of costume and look they're going to go for for each. Like rarely have we seen any kind of new or different interpretation of these programs. Yeah, and it's, it's that need for the ladies to look pretty, um, you know, look pretty and you may be rewarded compared to someone with like a bland, unpretty costume or someone who doesn't wear a skirt. And it makes me wonder if we're doing a disservice to the athletes by giving so much weight to the aesthetic. Would it be preferable to say as any other sport to not have costumes? So that it's only the skill of the athlete that's being judged. Uh, I feel like the mom in the Ice Princess movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, I think judges would find a way to work that kind of bias in. They will still give the extra points to the girl that looks the prettiest. On May Berenice and Vanessa James, I do find that in a lot of sports, not just figure skating, that masculine athletic label is applied far more readily to black athletes than their white counterparts. Uh, you look at some, a lot of the Canadian women, they have very good muscle definition. They're not always so feminine. They're quite, they can skate quite aggressive, but They're they don't powerful. get that label. Yeah, uh, the Canadian ladies are pretty powerful skaters. They have amazing uh, athletic bodies, but they don't get saddled with that label. Yeah, you have to mention that race is an issue in this situation too, because the ideal femininity is definitely tied to whiteness. You know, probably the most famous example of this um, in figure skating is Surya Bonelli. She's a five-time European champion. She was a, a black French skater and she was co constantly criticized for lacking artistry, but praised for athleticism and her technically difficult programs. So yeah, there's, I think there's always a question of how the lower scoring was due to actual weakness in her skating and how much of it was racism. but. Anyway, she tried to raise her artistry score through trying to adhere to the more feminine ideal in figure skating. But you could definitely argue that she was doomed from the start due to the Eurocentric ideals upheld by the judges and the skating world in general, I feel. Yeah, and I think even when like powerful athletic performances are praised, they're sort of sometimes done in a way that just sort of entrenches this dichotomy, right? So for example, like when Johnny Weir was praising Wakaba Hikuchi's free skate at the Cup of China last year, he was sort of saying that like, oh, it's great to see her like doing something so powerful, unlike the other Japanese ladies who tend to portray wilting flowers. Um, you know, and I, I doubt that Johnny was deliberately, you know, trying to insult the other Japanese ladies, but it really just reveals how these attitudes are kind of still almost played in opposition to each other like you can't have one or the other and I think this sort of attitude really limits originality in the sport and this idea that it's not safe to kind of do something very very unconventional with an established piece or try to challenge new music um, I think it sort of keeps it stuck with its classical image and it makes it really difficult for um, figure skating to appeal to new audiences especially in the ladies um, so an example that comes to mind is Jimmy Ma's Turn Down For What, like, program last year, which, like, it was exuberant and amazing. Um, and it went viral precisely because it was completely unexpected, right, to do a figure skating program to that music. And that's the sort of stuff that would get 
casual viewers more interested in figure skating um and you know music and art is constantly evolving and skaters should also do so with the modern times and if there's sort of this constant underlying concern about being underscored or punished for skating to something outside the box like that's something that makes it very difficult for them to break new boundaries um so while i don't think for example like alina zagatova's swan lake moonlight mashup was done with sort of any kind of finesse in music or choreography like i found the music cuts kind of awkward like i can at least appreciate the attempt to make it slightly different on that note Yvette Toff should have been thought like given so much more praise for her ACDC uh, program because yeah. the moment I saw that I was like I love this it's so different and it's so fun and when I was getting into figure skating one of the things that stopped me was I had this idea of figure skating being samey and boring it was girls in pretty dresses skate skating to the same music and yeah. not really having any kind of sense of fun or performance or connection i think yeah like it's really shuts people out if they're not into classical music and opera because that is the predominant stereotype that yeah. you associate mm-hmm. with figure skating as someone who is at worlds like when yvette toth's like program came on like there was this noticeable like just jump in energy in the arena because people were like oh my god like I know this song we can sing along like we know this um and it's those sort of moments that will gain attention not only among figure skating fans but also in general media and you know if we're trying to popularize figure skating more as a sport like that's the sort of moments that really help it along yeah I think it's also important to mention that the majority of figure skating judges and the ISU itself you know they're all in their in the later half of their life basically and they there's something that you know the program i'm not so, okay okay i'm not saying the entire isu was full of old white men but you know that's exactly but what i'm saying but um, you wouldn't be wrong exactly yeah. you know there's you know, there's certain things that those the judges like and of course figure skaters are, especially in olympic years i find they want to appeal to the judges more and staying in the boxes of what's traditionally masculine or traditionally feminine is much safer in terms of scoring or in terms of being perceived by the judges as a whole. Another thing is that, in my view, uh, non-figure skating fans tend to underestimate how difficult figure skating is because of this uh, perception that um, it's something that young pretty girls do and therefore it can't be so difficult if they can do it. And, you, you know, the ladies then seem to showcase that by their gracefulness on the ice, which often makes them appear delicate, which, of course, this is absolutely false because anyone who knows anything at all about figure skating should realize that appearing graceful throughout an extremely physically demanding program is one of the most difficult things ever. Yeah, and like every Olympic cycle, there is always someone who's like, figure skating is not a real sport. Like, it's it's clockwork by this point. Um, and I hear two arguments about this usually. Um, one, that it's not a real sport if there are subjective judges and a tangent, but like while we may have internal problems with how judges apply these marks, there are actually objective criteria for these so-called artistic subjective scores. And like, let's not even go into the fact that sports like football also have subjective umpires judging stuff. But like second, I think it's hard not to sort of see that the glamour and performing art side of skating which is unique to it does play a part in the skepticism that some people have about figure skating and like let's be honest it's because performing arts is conventionally viewed more as a feminine domain Uh, consider ashley wagner's comments in espn where she addressed uh, specifically and said i think figure skating has this stereotype as a sport for little girls that we are these pretty porcelain dolls that's a direct quote And she did get criticism for this uh, because many felt that she was putting down a certain style of skating, you know, the ones who do present that image. But mostly it seemed to me that she wants to just defend figure skating against those who would not consider it a real sport. And the fact that she felt the need to do this to play up the athleticism and put down the sparkles shows that sort of she has sort of an insecurity in how she's being perceived. And there is that inherent tension between displaying the performance aspect a certain image that is meant to be pretty, and then also being taken seriously as an athlete. 
And it's worth talking about how it feels like many athletes have to resort to playing down the prettiness as though it legit legitimizes them more if they do. Yeah, we're going to touch more on this in depth in a later episode about health and figure skating. And please be aware that this might be a triggering topic for some listeners. But it's also undeniable that long and lean is the body type prize in a sport that you know prizes aesthetics of a performance as much as the physicality side of things. Both Adam Rippon and Gracie Gold have spoken out about the pressures to maintain their weight and body shape that led to eating disorders, which also impacted their propensity for injury. Okay, so moving on to men's then. Um, I think this inherent division between masculinity and femininity is even more starkly highlighted in this discipline. Um, and I think it's important to say like these perceptions about men and femininity aren't unique to figure skating, but it's like a sport of performing arts as well. So I think it's important to talk about this. And personally, I think there are many qualities like gracefulness, elegance, and power that really shouldn't be associated with a particular gender in the first place. And so I would sort of put this as a caveat at the start by saying it's like the subtext of all of this. But, you know, since these qualities are still inevitably traditionally and conventionally seen as masculine and feminine, we're going to kind of proceed with this understanding that, you know, that's the framework we're going to be adopting. Yeah. So I think like there's always going to be bias against men in performing arts overall um, in society. And that's a sort of symptom of a whole bunch of uh, gender issues in society. But I think what we're going to focus on here is kind of examining how these gender biases are reinforced within the sport by its media and also by its audience. So I think there's this perception in skating media that like men's figure skating has to distinguish itself from female figure skating by sort of being manly enough or it won't attract audiences or somehow be sort of less respectable. And so I think this has led over like the course of the entire history of the sport to this constant emphasis on masculine elements in men's figure skating. So the quads, the strain on the bodies, like how difficult it is to do the quads. And that's all fine. But then you have people like Elvis Stoiko in 2009 saying like they've really got to showcase that male skating is about masculinity, strength and power. And you get comments about, for example, Nathan Chen before the Olympics, which emphasize how difficult the quads are, saying he was bringing like athleticism into figure skating as if that sort of was lacking there before somehow. Um, and, you know, Plushenko's outright just said without quads, it's not men. So there's this preoccupation, I think, with making sure that everyone knows this is male figure skating and like <laughs> it's powerful and there are quads and they jump. And then you think about it and you're like, but for the most part, ladies and men do pretty much the same elements, like apart from quads, but like we see young girls landing quads now too. Um, and so technically ladies and men's figure skating are only a little bit separate in terms of the, the nature of the elements being attempted. So we see that this preoccupation with masculinity is kind of also a way of distinguishing the males from the females, but also like I think it's worth questioning how wide this definition actually is and how much they shape the packaging of male skaters. Yeah, I, I'm since young ladies are landing quads now, are we going to start calling a skaters like Alexandra Trusova uh, masculine? Is the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if they, like, you know, if we follow the media's equation of, like, quads equals masculine and manly and powerful, like, it, it does feel like a very artificial kind of association or something that they're very anxious to push, perhaps, is the better way to put it. Especially since not all of the men have quads. Only the top, say, six or so have more than one quad. And out of the top... 10 not many men have quads there's still plenty of men that only have triples are they less masculine i feel like a lot of the quad now the quad narrative in the media is just an attempt for them to differentiate between men figure skating and women figure skating you know they have to find the divide somewhere because masculinity and femininity are always poised in opposition to each other so the natural course of action is to say well quads are masculine because there are basically no women doing quads so we're going to focus on the athleticism around that in our reporting of the sport which really just proves how arbitrary the definition of feminine and masculine really is yeah yeah 
And I think while there's nothing wrong with being feminine, um, I think to just dismiss certain qualities like gracefulness and elegance as like, oh, here he's got feminine elements in his program, I think ignores the fact that these qualities like elegance, emotiveness, expressiveness, they can be part of an overall expression of masculinity and occur within it. Just as sort of masculine qualities like power and like competitiveness and drive can be a natural part of how femininity is expressed. Um, but when you label these qualities as feminine or masculine, you're still maintaining this divide between the two instead of kind of considering if this is simply a new or different expression of masculinity. And I think this is particularly interesting with the rise of Asian male skaters in the past quad as like the top men, because in Asia, like there are completely different cultural standards and codes of behavior for gender expression. And so things that you might like from a Western perspective see as feminine may be coded and understood completely differently in Asia. And living in Korea for almost five years, I would say that's exactly right. Um, the What is acceptable behavior for a man here is completely different than in North America or Europe. Like, I completely agree with you, Gina. And it's interesting how, for example, you can see the the remnants of this traditional understanding of masculinity in older Western commentators like Dick, Dick Button, who tend to be more effusive in like praising, like for example, Javier's style, which we understand as more traditional because he tends to play like debonair sort of male icons like Elvis or the Man of La Mancha. Um, and even from a costume perspective, we can see a lot of male skaters tend to wear, let's put it bluntly, like really bland costumes. Like yeah. it's usually, it's like a shirt and pants. Um, they're in subdued colors, they're simple cuts. They kind of look like they're going to the store with them. And like you tend to see, I think, less of this like baggage, I suppose, or this trend with um, Asian men, for example, Japanese men's costumes tend to be more theatrical, but they're not. In Japan, no one would ever look at that and think, oh, he's skating in a girl's blouse, even if there are sort of frills and ruffles everywhere. So I think it's just, it's important to be aware that these expressions of gender are different across cultures and w looking at it with only a Western lens is very limiting. Personally, I think that if costumes are going to be an inherent part of figure skating, um, and you know, this is a discussion that exists, we'll be talking about in a future episode, but if it should exist, then costumes should be interesting and suitable for the programs. So if men instead opt for black clothes with simple cuts, what's the point of using costumes in the first place? Why not just then go for uniforms like in, other, in any other sport? Yeah, and I think it's important, like we're not bagging out male skaters for their personal choices necessarily. Like Nathan Chen has said he just really hates sequins personally. <laughs> and I think that's fine. Like you don't, not every costume has to have sequins and frills and be over the top. But I think that a lot of male skaters tend to phone in on finding creative costumes that don't involve like sequins and frills. <laughs> like it's just, there's this understanding, I suppose, that maybe costuming is less important maybe in the minds of some male skaters and from western countries in particular and it seems to go against this idea that if it's a performing arts like if skating is part of performing arts then costuming and those considerations are important in the packaging i don't particularly mind if costumes are lacking in creativity either um so long as what they end up with suits the program it's fine so in 2017's world we had javier with malaguena and patrick chan with his dear prudence and they had the same costume which was just black pants black shirt um it didn't really bother me so much because the two programs were so completely different and the way that they performed was so different that it didn't really stand out too much. But I wouldn't want to see every man dressing in the exact same thing in a uniform. I wouldn't want to see every man looking like Kevin Reynolds in that outfit <laughs> when he just looked like he was running late from the office. <laughs> oh, yeah. And not every man has to wear sequins and be user on you, so... <laughs> No, because it has to it has to fit their body type, their skating style, and their music. And not everyone is made for sequins. If you look at some of Javier Fernandez's 
earlier costumes when he was a lot younger. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. He had some more showier costumes and it didn't really suit him. Like it's embarrassing to look back at. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, let's not be me. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, Harvey. <laughs> he had a glow up. Definitely. He looks really yeah. good now. We can agree. We can agree on that. Definitely. But it's also important to mention that if you, you know, previously if you were a male skater who did like sequins or wanted to dress in a way that wasn't conventionally masculine, you know, you would have a fear a lot of backlash for dressing in any other way other than the norm so I think this is a good time to segue into our focus on the responses to two key skaters which are Johnny Weir and Yuzuru Hanyu. Since costumes and packaging is one of the first things that new fans and unfamiliar audiences see, costume choices by male skaters also opens them up to mainstream scorn and suspicion around challenges to conventional masculinity. Uh, you know, like Leslie Jones in the Olympics com- commented, the Notte Stellata costume was a girl's top. And uh, interestingly, she was positive about Adam's sparkly top, but hated Shoma's outfit. So, you know, maybe it's just an issue of taste. It does make me <laughs> yeah. think about a particular quote from, I think it was Eddie Izzard, where he's like, no, this is not a woman's dress. I bought this dress. It's mine. So, <laughs> yeah, like that, that not his Stellata top was made for Yuzuru Hanyu. It's not a girl's top. It's his top. Yeah. Um, and Johnny Weir was sort of a key victim of this sort of mainstream scorn, like in the Vancouver Olympics, the French Canadian analysts, Alan Goldberg and Claude Melhort commented that he should compete in the women's competition, that he should undergo gender testing. And, you know, that's stuff that was covered in the media. Um, but you know, I think Johnny should be acknowledged for continuing to put out programs that continue to challenge conventions, like his Crete with a long skirt. And I think this brings us to Yuzuru, who did benefit from the ground that Johnny paved. And I think while, you know, we can't take the cesspool of YouTube comments as a full representation of responses, I think it's interesting that a distinct portion of negative responses Yuzuru gets is sort of around how girly or pretty or childlike or like feminine he is or his costumes are and like I think people are free to subjectively dislike his style but it's interesting that if you for example push a few to explain a lot of this subjective dislike is rooted in sort of this discomfort around the feminine qualities of his style and I think I'm using Yuzuru as a particular example because he happens to challenge kind of I would say four facets of masculinity at once with his dating style, his appearance, his costume and race. So he's definitely not the only one who is kind of subject to these comments and obviously as the most popular skater I would say right now um, he gets proportionally more of these but I think we'll use him as a kind of case study or representative of some of these wider issues. The fact that the skating of Nathan Chen and Javier Fernandez, who are seen as more typically masculine skaters, it's not stronger by any means compared to what Yuzu Hanyu does. You know, the enormous strength and athleticism required to perform quad jumps is present in all of them. So it's not about them actually being stronger and more athletic. It's just about how their skating styles are being perceived and you know a lot of the perceived femininity comes down to skating style but you know what exactly is feminine about his style he values a sort of grace and softness in his movements but you would have to have a very strict division between masculinity and femininity to argue that he is a feminine skater based on the fact that he's graceful since that that's you know more skill than anything for example, Patrick Chan is graceful too, but he's rarely been criticized for being feminine. So I feel like even with within technical elements themselves, there's an inherent division of being traditionally feminine and traditionally masculine. Like for the traditionally feminine elements, you know, you have the layback spin and the Beelman. And like Patrick Chan said that he couldn't do a Beelman spin. Like he he, he wishes. And then he, he fo- followed up in an interview going, no, actually, I don't wish, you know, you sort of lose respect among the men. And I quite like that um, even though Yuzuru has got some comments about his skating style and had some disrespect from other athletes about the elements that he does, instead of taking them out, he has moved them to be the highlights of his program. And it, like my first exposure to Yuzuru was Sochi and... I distinctly remember hearing some commentary or something that explained that part of his program was considered to be feminine and that the Beelman and the Layback in a Bower were considered to be parts of 
female skating. And I th it was one of the things that I found really interesting about him and actually brought me into the sport because it was something not everyone else was doing. Yeah, but Yuzu is not the only one who performs like the Bielman spin. Like there's skaters like Michael Christian Martinez from the Philippines. Adam Rippon does a layback spin. Jason Brown does spirals. And they don't, but they, these skaters don't seem to get the same kind of negative comments surrounding the fact that they're skating like girls or skating in feminine ways. Yeah, um, you know, I rarely ever see anyone being like, is that a girl for Jason Brown? But like you get that all the time with Yuzu. Um, yeah. or not all the time but you do get that um, and I think that potentially ties it into the second point which is appearance right so Jason isn't as for example slender or as androgynous as Yuzu and even like Johnny Weir and I think I think that allows him to dodge some of these kind of comments about oh I mistook him for a girl or like is that a girl skating um, and even for example with Shoma's style like of skating He's frequently likened to Daisuke and described as charismatic um, and his, his costumes are just as ornate as Yuzuru's. So it's kind of interesting how these comments and these judgments are not applied evenly or based on anything that is like concrete. It's, is it because like Shoma's expression and demeanor is more aggressive and intense? Like does that exude more masculinity? Is it about body type? You know, um, and I think interestingly, like Adam Rippon, for example, looks like very, he's, he's a beautiful man. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> oh, um, for sure, for sure. <laughs> he is a very pretty He's man. very pretty. But, um, but like, you know, since he's openly gay, like I think it's actually his sort of diva-esque qualities or perhaps what we would call his feminine mannerisms um, in the traditional sense, they actually receive like exuberant support from at least American media because I think it fits with society's understanding of like what gay men are like. He's kind of the archetypal gay man and he's very proud of it and he owns up to it. And I think that's wonderful. But I think somehow it feels like it's treated with more suspicion if that's not the case. And, you know, Yuzuru has never spoken or been asked publicly about his sexuality, but I think it challenges people more when there is this possibility oh this guy might be straight but he still acts like this how is this possible like there's this sort of cognitive dissonance or this this in this higher level of questioning and suspicion perhaps and controversy <laughs> around gender when it when in this sort of context it's because as a society we have a very narrow understanding of gender expression and sexuality and we think that there's just this box you are either straight or you're gay you are either masculine or you're feminine when in reality everything is a spectrum and everyone is somewhere on that spectrum and everyone identifies in a way that has some elements of femininity, some elements of masculinity. It Gender isn't one or the other. Yeah. And I would even argue that a lot of Yuzuru's programs that are typically labelled as feminine are more agender. He's not really expressing agender. He's focused on a particular concept or an aesthetic and is unconcerned about the perceived femininity of the costuming or the elements or other aspects of its presentation. So for example, um, his new exhibition program, Haru Yokoi, he has the pink, he has the floaty sleeves, and rather than feeling feminine to me, that gives me the impression of spring, which is the point of the program. You know, when he goes into that spin and he outstretches his arms, it feels like a breeze coming through a blossom tree. and. I think that's more of what his costumes are chosen to fit his style of skating and his music and his preferred aesthetic. Programs like Etude and Chopin and Hope and Legacy, for me, they seem completely unconcerned with gender and so lack overt masculinity as a result, but they're also not feminine. His only outright feminine program, in my opinion, is his 2013 to 2014 Free Skate, where he was deliberately playing the role of Juliet. And he has more masculine programs too. And they're also expressing masculinity through the lens of specific roles or characters like Prince, um, Abe no Sene, 
and Romeo. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it feels like my interpretation is that he's not so constrained in his creative expression by concerns of like what is masculine or feminine. Like there's not this sense that, oh, I can't do this because it's not masculine or it doesn't fit with my masculine self image. Um, I think he puts the kind of concept and the desire to create this ethereal like feeling or emotion um, first. And that's not, and those feelings are not necessarily ones that we associate with masculinity. Um, but it's like, it feels like it transcends or it kind of blurs the boundaries um, and puts the focus on something other than gender, which is kind of refreshing. I yeah, think. I mean, I don't really perceive Yuzuga as feminine at all. He has a certain flair in his costuming that is not so common, but he doesn't dress like lady skaters do. You know, like he does wear pants. So it's more like <laughs> color and details than a lot of the men. But that's that's more a personal aesthetic, I feel. Yeah, I think I think it's really important when we're discussing Yuzu and his perceived femininity to also bring in the subject of race because I think a lot of the perception of Yuzu's skating style and his appearance out on the ice is very rooted in the way that Asian men, specifically East Asian men, are perceived as unmasculine or in sort of in an, a sense of otherness like I like Jeannie you mentioned how yeah he has more masculine programs like and one of the programs that he did in uh 2016-17 let's go crazy you know his performance out on the ice is more traditionally you know you would think that it would be a more masculine character you know he's trying to be cheeky out on the ice he's flirting almost with the crowd but yet judges didn't really praise his performance of masculinity in the same way that they would have praised other maybe non-Asian skaters, I feel. I also feel like the same is kind of true for his Parisian walkways. Um, yes. He was very boyish, he was very cheeky, very flirty, and he also didn't really get, it doesn't really get discussed much as that as one of his masculine programs and again I found that really interesting when he was also skating it with the Romeo and Juliet because he had a masculine fo a program and a feminine character at the same time and I think that's especially really brave to do in Russia definitely <laughs> yeah for sure yeah and like even with the boob skirt you know the very feminine <laughs> uh <laughs> the rj2 out, uh, costume like again i just sort of it's interesting to me how frequently i see comments about like oh i thought he was a girl because literally i don't think he's ever been sort of accused of that by asian audiences and so i think western sort of cultural perceptions definitely factors into their interpretation of his costumes and his programs like his mannerisms and demeanor reads completely differently in Asian contexts and not to mention when speaking Japanese like he definitely has like masculine speech patterns and it's sort of undeniable if you listen to him speaking Japanese that he is like a guy yeah um, yeah really a guy. yeah yeah so it's just I think it's important as figure skating audiences and when you're considering your initial reaction to not just Yuzu but like to any skater to be aware that you are influenced by your cultural upbringing and by how your culture defines masculine, feminine and gender in general. Yeah, I mean, I get the distinct impression that whenever particularly white men complain about feminine male men skaters like Yuzuru, like Johnny, it's more that they're upset about their own responses to a skater rather than a valid subjective issue that would warrant lower scores other than being bad for the sport. Like they don't like looking, they don't like how looking at Yuzuru makes them feel. They didn't <laughs> like how looking at Johnny made them feel because they're both pretty <laughs> and it threatens their own understanding of their own masculinity and sexuality that, and they project that on them. Johnny Wynn knows who he is. He is perfectly fine with his identity. Yuzuru Hanyu knows who he is. He's perfectly fine with his identity as a man. Both of them have no issues with their masculinity. But the men who are upset saying they're too feminine they're really just upset about the way that looking at these pretty boys skating makes them feel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, we can't speak of uh, gender bias and figure skating without talking about homophobia. 
since the accusations of femininity inevitably follow up with, oh, they must be gay. Yeah. And I would add, first of all, it's sort of none of our business as figure skating fans or media to really speculate on sexuality in the first place. Like, this is sort of, I want to sing this out as like the underlying song of the people. Like, someone's sexual preferences, sexuality does not affect their performance as a figure skater. It shouldn't really even be part of the conversation, but it is. Um, and I think it's, you know, if we're going to address it, it's problematic to assume that being feminine, right? Again, what even defines femininity, but those sort of traditional, performing these traditional um, feminine associated mannerisms or costumes or programs, it's problematic to assume that that means they're gay or to use it as evidence um, for someone's sexuality because they not only, it's not only like irrelevant, it's also perpetuating stereotypes about sexuality and homosexuality in, in particular. Oh, definitely. And it's also problematic to assume that figure skating is not a homophobic sport or take for granted that it's easy to come out because everyone assumes you are already gay um, because it is quite stigmatized as well. And, you know, male figure skaters still have the stereotype of being gay in like outside of the figure skating world, the perception. And, you know, there's this anxiety to sort of erase that because it's perceived to be bad for business to, And they're, therefore, you know, overemphasizing the masculinity of figure skating, uh, as we've talked about before. It's also it's it's important to note that, you know, very few figure skaters uh, came out during their Olympic eligible careers. So skaters like Adam Rippon and Eric Radford, Rudy Galindo and Yorick Hendricks, they're all skaters that have come out in the in time that they were eligible and competing. And obviously it has improved. Um, the situation has improved for, say, Adam Rippon. Um, he still, I don't think, is treated particularly well. But compared to how Johnny Weir was treated or the way that Rudy Galindo was treated, Adam Rippon and Eric Radford, they have a much better time of it. Um, Jorick Hendricks as well, when he came out, he was mostly embraced by figure skating fans but we do have that history in the sport and I think it needs to be taken into account especially when you consider that compared to some skaters that may be perceived as being more masculine um Adam Rippon's scores particularly for performance components weren't particularly high I don't know if you could necessarily draw like a direct connection between like low PCs and like you know homophobia or like hostile attitudes towards homosexuality i think we maybe could with johnny Werwick uh, because he was always assumed to be gay because of his flamboyancy and he is one of those memorable skaters that people will think about for years to come um, as being a driving force to really changing the way that certain skaters skate and opening up the ex the kinds of expression that men's skating exhibits but he wasn't always well treated by judges or by the media or even by his own teammates i'm pretty sure yeah definitely. there were some yeah. like pretty nasty Evan or... check. yeah with the homophobic tweets well mm -hmm. transphobic well however you want to classify it when he questioned uh, Johnny's gender, basically. And I think it also is important to say that like homosexuality, for example, is still a very taboo issue in Asia and Russia. Um, and so, you know, I think in, for example, Russia, male skaters are perceived differently and they there is this emphasis, I suppose, built by, you know, skaters like Kalashenko and their styles on you know being masculine and being a masculine ideal living up to that so i think it's it would be incorrect to kind of say that oh like everything's okay in the figure skating world regarding homophobia just because you know some just because skaters were not treated as egregiously as johnny weir was throughout his entire career yeah and also, but also one thing that's interesting is the whole thing that um in in media the qualifying of uh, male figure skaters in articles by mentioning like proof of their heterosexuality 
you know, like interest in other sports or their relationships with, you know, if they have girlfriends or wives, like there always needs to be a disclaimer, you know, not gay. <laughs> so yeah, imagine no like homo. <laughs> no homo. Just gay in. Imagine if articles on football players had to like reaffirm their heterosexuality, you know, it would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like that being said, if you're in an article, they're asking you like, what are your other interests outside of figure skating? Like, I think they can be valid, like article questions, but I think there is that defensiveness in some ways. The way it sort of frames like, oh, I wear sparkles, but I'm actually a man's man, you know? Yeah. 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 I think at the weekends, I chop wood. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I drive a big car that's very noisy. So I think it's just, it's important to kind of be aware that this is the kind of caveats that male skaters have to throw on their sport. And we question whether that is, you know, deserved or healthy or any of those qualities and it's not a problem unique to figure skating but it is a symptom of sort of these wider issues about what masculinity can be and it's just reflected very prominently in a sport like figure skating yeah also let me just add that you know this um this entire conversation or mainstream discourse in skating is almost always framed like in a very uh cis sexist way you know uh like discussion on how male skaters or female skaters tend to sort of favor or disfavor certain elements always operates under the presumption that everyone is cis like we've also split it into masculinity and femininity in this discussion and you know it's so strange when we know that the world is much more nuanced than just these two twin poles. Um, but in fairness, there has never been an openly trans skater competing on an elite level, which of course has uh, a lot of reasons. I think it would be extremely difficult for a skater to come out as trans and transition. I mean, these skaters that get to the senior level, they first have to go through juniors. And they have to go through puberty under the eye of the judges. It would be extremely difficult for them to transition while competing. They wouldn't be... Yeah, there there are like, you know, uh, certain requirements that are quite also very like invasive. You know, like Mm -hmm. you can compete at the Olympics if you meet certain conditions as a trans athlete, which is, you know, quite strict like with regards to you know surgery etc yeah so the requirements for um for performing under your chosen gender so if you are a trans person if you wanted to skate as a trans woman and you wanted to skate in the ladies field you would have to be on hormone treatment for two years and you would also have to have the surgery and the surgery in particular i think is incredibly invasive and also completely pointless i don't have any idea how that surgery makes any difference towards how they would perform in the sport the hormone therapy i can kind of understand but the actual surgery in itself no i don't understand how that's relevant at all yeah and also intersex challenge they're often like forced into a gender box that doesn't completely fit and it also kind of reinforces the fact that you know the 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 biology has to match up with the psychological side of things because not all trans people choose to medically transition it might not be for them and some people and a lot of trans people aren't aren't able to you know there's a quite there's a, a large financial investment involved and that a lot of people simply can't afford so i think it's very shallow of both the ISU and the IOC to put a lot of these boundaries up in place for trans athletes. Oh, definitely. We do have things like uh, the gay games, for example, where, you know, trans skaters are openly allowed to compete without these requirements. And I think, you know, it's great that we have something like the trans games um, is as a way to sort of be able to embrace yourself, even though, of course, the reason that we need to have those is because... um, you know, like they they can't compete on equal terms in regular competitions. So, yeah. I think also like you see it, you know, not 
as frequently, but there have been instances of skaters in, and commentators in the past that have espoused kind of anti-trans sentiments with sort of little to no pushback. And that extends to things like Evan Lysacek, like, you know, questioning Johnny Weir's gender, like all of that stuff is pretty like hurtful and just sort of very casually um, anti-trans. And it it's just worth, I suppose, realizing that these sorts of issues are like underlying and endemic in the skating world and while it may not be like an active attack it sort of plays into the frameworks in which commentators like perceive things and commentate on things you know like oh they're very girly or like you know i mistook him for a girl or i thought that was a female skating like all of these things are you know hurtful in more ways than one um and they not only show gender bias but it can be quite an issue for trans communities and trans fans and i think it's just in this context where the isu constantly stresses that figure skating needs to reach a wider audience like these are issues that should be considered and you know be be brought into the spotlight as well as conservative as the ISU seems to be with regards to gender issues in general, it does sometimes feel like we're 50 years back in the skating world sometimes. Um, I feel as though it will be a while longer before we can see an openly trans skater compete at the highest level. And when that does happen, I'm certain that said skaters will be, you know, on the receiving end of a lot of scrutiny. I mean, and the final sort of discipline and issues maybe to touch briefly on is also that this sort of heteronormativity, this male and masculine and feminine is probably most stark in pairs and I stance disciplines. Um, and, you know, as well as that, there is also a disadvantage in that it is not only heteronormative, there's also focus on romance and on like, you know, the romantic dynamic between the male and the female in a pair or ice dance team. And so we see this in, for example, comments about the Shibutanis throughout the Olympics, you know, they've, and throughout their career, really, they've had to defend the fact that they are sibling they're a sibling team and so they can't perform a lot of the kind of expected genres or movements or have that dynamic of romance and sort of will they won't they that like is the basis of a lot of the um pairs and ice dance teams or ice dance maybe more than pairs the theme for next season is straight up tango romantica you know it sho shoves the skaters into a very very narrow box yeah, I don't blame the Shibutanis for sitting that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I feel sorry for all of the sibling teams that are competing next season under Tango Romantica. It's just, it's very, really, really unfortunate. I mean, it it ends up in a sort of very stereotypical performance of heterosexuality. You know, the strong man shows off the delicate, graceful lady. There's a certain performance of traditional romance where like the man literally and figuratively has to carry and lead the woman. Well, I think that that's, that's also based on the fact that ice dance as a discipline is also very rooted in ballroom dancing and a lot of the same yeah. tropes appear in both sports. Yeah, I mean, th but this sort of leads to, especially in ice dance, that they end up playing like the same story over and over. Yeah. Also in pairs and ice dance, I find myself only watching the lady. Like, I, yeah. I don't watch the men at all, <laughs> which is not helped by the fact that the men are almost always in entirely black and just disappear whilst the female skater has a more typical, like, showy costume. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's very clear what type of costumes are acceptable for men and for women. And, you know, also the fact that uh, women are not allowed to wear pants in ice stands unless it's, like, specifically allowed for, you know, like, for the hip-hop theme, um... Etc. I just think structurally, um, you know, figure skating as a sport is still held back a lot by these traditions. And it's just a question of whether if they want figure skating to, you know, be more attractive to modern day audiences and want it to gain attention in mainstream media, like that's really not the kind of flavor and the atmosphere, as, especially in the Western like world, I suppose, um, you know, things that are attracting attention are things that challenge convention and challenge gender expression. And so, you know, I think these issues still remain in the sport and amongst its media and even through a lot of its fans. And so it's just something to keep in mind if the ISU is really gunning for like wider audience interest and coverage. My personal wish list 
same sex ice dance. Yeah. Please, in the future, yes. let us see same sex ice dance. I really don't understand why they wouldn't have it because if you look at, say, gymnastics, gymnastics is a similar sport in many ways. And they have, particularly for um, the athletic gymnastics, they have teams of, of mixed gender. They have mixed gender and same gender pairs that compete against each other. And it's not an issue. It's not something anyone is really worried about. Please, I assume if you're listening, we want same-sex ice dance and peers. Please give it to us. Well, not so much license to kill, more license to thrill. We uh, are trying out a end segment this week, which will be called the shout out of the week. And hopefully we will do it for the future episodes as well. And uh, shout out of the week goes to uh, Nobunai Oda, teasing return from retirement after Daisuke Takahashi announced his, which I think is very, very cruel because there are a lot of us who would actually want to see him return from uh, return from retirement. So, you know, yes, like, it was just a joke, but that was cruel, Nobu. That was very cruel. Please, Don't play Nobu, with our emotions back. like that. <laughs> with Daisuke Takahashi coming back and proving that you can skate and be over 30, it would be really nice for Nobunari to come back as well and be landing a quad lutz at over 30. I, for one, would like to see the return of all the Team Japan uncles. Definitely. If you're listening to this, Nobu, we want you back. Please. (laughs) So thanks for the day. We hope to see you again in two weeks for episode six, where we'll be discussing iconic figure skating news stories. If you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via Twitter at InTheLowPodcast or on Tumblr at InTheLowPodcast.tumblr.com. We're on YouTube as well. Just search for In The Loop Podcast and you'll find our episodes there too. And if you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving a rating and review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This is Min, Evie, Tilda, Gina, and Leigh. See you soon.